If you want to write an unraveling mystery pilot script that provides just enough questions and answers to intrigue an audience, then look no further for an example than Apple TV's Severance. Writing a great pilot script is a skill in itself. You'll often hear people say that the first season of their favourite series is a little shaky at times, but it gets better from there. And that's because the show is still figuring out what it wants to be. A pilot script has to, over a short period of time, lay out the rules of the universe that the story exists in, give us some backstory of what was happening up until now, and tease us with potentially intriguing storylines that might emerge from here. In essence, the job of a pilot episode is to leave the audience wanting more. But the challenge for any writer is finding the correct balance between asking questions and providing answers. Pilots can be frustrating to write as you worry that you didn't clarify everything yet. Unless you're writing a procedural, it's not like writing a movie where the conflict is all resolved by the closing credits. You need to not say it all, but still say just enough. Because if you throw too much information at the audience, then it turns into an exposition dump that often feels convoluted. It's important to remember that all stories involve exposition, but what makes any story you love work so well is the timing of when that information is revealed. For example, if Star Wars A New Hope's opening scroll read, Darth Vader is actually Anakin Skywalker, Luke Skywalker's father, but Luke doesn't know that yet, then the story wouldn't be as interesting. But picking the perfect moment and method for that information to be revealed is everything to the audience. That's impossible! As it recontextualizes the entire story up until that point and poses intriguing questions for the next installment. It essentially whets the appetite for the viewer and they then try to predict what could happen next. And it's the job of the writer to give the audience what they want, but not directly what they expect. But what makes Severance such a complex pilot to construct is that it's setting up a unique world that not even the lead characters fully understand. It has to explain the rules of this world slowly and let the audience gradually put the pieces of the puzzle together. So writer Dan Erickson is posing questions, partially answering them, before leaving the audience with another bigger question. For me, getting this balance correct involves masterfully executing three keys. Structure, world building, and questions and answers. Let's see how these keys consistently work in tandem to create a pretty perfect pilot episode that sets us up for the series. Now obviously there's going to be some spoilers for Severance here, but they're only going to be for the first episode, not the rest of the season. I highly recommend that you give this series a chance either way, as it's definitely offering up something new. Who are you? The opening shot immediately grabs our attention. It's an overhead angle of a woman lying on a table as she's posed the existential question, Who are you? over and over from a voice through a mysterious speaker. This question is confrontational and confusing, as either they know who she is and something weird is happening, or she doesn't belong there. The woman seems as confused as the audience, which instantly signals that this character is going to be our portal into this world, meaning we will vicariously learn information at the same rate she does. Hi there. You on the table? I wonder if you'd mind taking a brief survey. The speaker then changes to an upbeat tone, trying to get her to complete a survey. After trying and failing to escape, she chooses to engage in the survey, which involves five basic questions like who are you and what state were you born in, but she can't answer them. Structurally, this scene is what's known as a teaser, the opening to a script that draws the audience in. For a mystery script like this, it also immediately starts setting up the world of the story, showing us how this world is different to our own, as the scene concludes with Mark walking into the room and reassuring her that's a perfect score, even though she seems unsettled, and obviously this isn't how our memories are supposed to work. We then cut to the title card, Severance, communicating that in this world, this is normal. So structurally, we've had a teaser, which was also world building, and now the audience is left with lots of questions. What's going on? Where is she? Why can she not remember anything about herself? And why is she not supposed to? 
<laughs> the first act then begins, with Mark weeping in his car with no explanation, which adds to the already unsettling feeling. Everything just feels off. We then walk into his office, which continues the world building. It's clearly a corporation, there's a security protocol, other people work there, but Mark is isolated in another department. He leaves his personal belongings in a drawer, switches his shoes and watch. What seems routine to him is weird to us, posing bigger questions like, what exactly is his job? Then in the elevator, his expression changes as the vertigo effect of tracking in while zooming out signals an alteration in his character. We're then introduced to the office with peaceful music playing as a tranquil Mark walks through the excessively long corridors, the length of time it takes only posing more questions. Where is it leading? Why is it far away? And again, what exactly do they do here? The first act of any pilot is all prologue, setting up the basics of who the characters are and the world they exist in. But because this is a mystery story, Dan Erickson is only half answering the questions by showing Mark's unusual daily routine, as well as his bewildering work at the computer. Then he's called into his boss's office, which teaches us about the chain of command. Milchik is the supervisor, and Miss Cobell is his boss, who works for the board, signified only by a speaker. Everything about the social interactions is awkward and weird, as if it's emotionally disconnected, as Mark's responses show us that he doesn't fully understand basic human dynamics. Thank you, may I have a handshake? Now we shift into Act 2, Conflict. We learn that Petey, whoever that is, is no longer working for the company and is now being replaced by Helly, the woman from the opening teaser. Mark is promoted to department chief, but the surrounding characters keep informing us that Petey was Mark's closest work friend, but Mark seems to refuse to emotionally register that loss. Now that he's established as the department chief, we repeat and expand on the teaser scene, but from Mark's perspective. Then we move into Act 3, Rising Conflict. Mark tries to follow protocol, but Helly keeps lashing out. Ow! So he levels with her, and explains that he was once just like her, waking up on that table, threatening the voice that was asking him who he is. But that voice was Petey, and Petey became Mark's best friend. This firmly establishes that Helly replacing Petey is actually the inciting incident for the entire series, because it immediately catalyzes two forms of conflict. A new character is introduced that doesn't adapt well to this new environment, and the pre-existing characters, now impacted by the loss, start asking more questions. If either of these conflicts didn't exist, then the story might not progress. But because Helly is a loose cannon, and Mark is worried about his friend, this combination of emotional conflict progresses the plot long term. The conflict rises in the third act, when Helly learns that she can't leave. Even if she walks through the exit door, reality warps and she just ends up catapulting back into the same corridor, facing the other direction. She's essentially a prisoner. From here, Helly and the audience have their questions answered. It's revealed that she has willingly engaged in severance, meaning her access to her memories will be spatially dictated. She cannot access external memories when she's in work, and cannot retain work memories once she's outside of it. It's also clarified that this decision is irreversible. No matter how bad things get in here, her other self will still choose to come back to work each day, as she has no awareness of what's going on inside. So the third act's rising conflict essentially answers the questions from our act two conflict, but the answers reveal that the situation is much worse, while simultaneously clarifying more rules in the world building. Now we enter our fourth act, deeper understanding, which you guessed it, deepens our understanding of the conflicts the characters are in. In Severance, this expands our scope of the story by investigating Mark's life outside the office. For instance, a note is left on his car explaining the head injury delivered by Helly, but it's a comforting lie. He also sees Helly outside, but neither of them remember that they already know one another. Mark's home life is revealed to be isolated, mundane, and empty. His sister brings him to a party, saying he shouldn't be alone because it's coming up to the anniversary which gives us a hint that there's something else we don't know about Mark. And then at that dinner party, 
someone references Mark's late wife, Gemma. So notice how writer Dan Erickson gradually unravels the pieces of the puzzle. In the office world, we were drip-fed information to slowly lead us to the heaviest revelation, that Heli chose to engage in severance and therefore cannot leave. But a bigger question still remains for Heli. Why would she choose to do this to herself? And then in the outside world, we saw Mark weeping in his car, which raised the question, why is he so depressed? Then we saw how empty his life is, which might answer it. But then his sister references the anniversary, which raises more questions. And then we have it answered that his wife is dead. So step by step, we can piece together that Mark losing his wife is what led him to engage in severance, possibly because his depression was interfering with his ability to work, or because he needs an emotional break from the grief for eight hours a day. Then when people at the party learn Mark's job requires severance, we discover that it's a hot button issue that most people morally disagree with. This also answers a lingering audience question. Does everyone in this world engage in severance? And the answer is no. Each act is used to subtly yet strategically deliver the information the audience needs in order to continue the story, but no more than is absolutely required. The fifth and final act is used to establish new questions for future episodes. In the middle of the night, when Mark gets up to get a glass of water because he can't sleep, he sees a shadow outside, and when he checks it out, he discovers a man staring at him, who then disappears. Was he real, or in Mark's imagination? We see Mark not once but twice on the phone to his next door neighbour, Mrs Selvig, who seems to ask him a lot of personal information, raising the question, who is Mrs Selvig? Then the man interrupts Mark's meal at a diner, revealing he's Petey. This would mean a lot to Mark at work, but out here, he doesn't remember him. Petey reveals he's found a way to bypass the implant and reintegrate both sides of his memory. He warns Mark nothing is as they say it is, and gives him a card with an address at the back to learn more. When Mark goes home, we discover his next door neighbour, Mrs Selvig, is actually his boss, Miss Cobell. So the final act introduces and develops two new conflicts. Two cliffhangers for the audience, so they know that the next episode will give them even more coveted information. In just one episode, a huge amount was revealed to the audience. How Severance works, why Mark had the procedure, and the rules and chain of command at the office. All vitally important world building. Now if that information was just given to you right up front, it wouldn't be as interesting. But because the nature of the show is all about characters not knowing anything about the outside world, Dan Erickson makes that the nature of the storytelling, as well as the same thematic tone for the audience. We all need to figure this one out together. However, we're also left with lingering questions. Why did the other employees choose Severance? Why is Petey potentially in danger for leaving? Why is Mark's boss living next door? And the biggest question remains unanswered. What exactly do they do at work? Writing a sci-fi mystery isn't easy. Posing just the right amount of questions and delivering just enough answers to keep the audience engaged, informed, and needing to know more. And the show does this consistently. Every time it answers one question, that answer then deepens the story and blossoms into several new questions. We know that some characters have most of the information, but they're not our protagonists. And because something sinister is going on, that information isn't easy to access. This all leaves the viewer with the feeling of being a part of an unraveling mystery. So if you're thinking of writing a curious pilot script that gets this balance of structure, world building, and questions and answers perfectly right, then look no further for an example than Severance, one of my new favorite TV shows. If you enjoy content like this and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out. Or if you can't afford that, then simply like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment down below to help the algorithm do its thing.